Dad is the best dad there ever was. And, and so there's many, many articles online where you can read and actually it tells you, well, what it takes to be the best dad. And maybe some of you dads are, are looking at me and saying, I, I got that done already, Pastor Jay. I am the best dad, uh, at least on this side of the street. But you know, there's, there's, as I said, I wanted to share with you an article that, that talked about tips for being the best dad. And so I, I asked Jesse to put, it, put up a, um, a PowerPoint on it so that it'll be easier for us to kind of remember and easier for us to understand. And so tips for being the best dad. Number one tip, they said, is to put their interests first. And what are they talking about there? Since we're talking about dads, we're not talking about husbands. So the implication is if they're talking about your children. Does that make sense? So um, it says put their interests first, and that is your children. The second one is protect them. Again, you're talking about your children. So I hope you dads are, you know, you have a, you have a, 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 a check mark going on inside your brain going, done this, done that. The next one is spend your spare time with them. Now, maybe this one we fail a lot. doesn't matter if you're a mother or, or, a, or a father, but, you know, Spare time in this country, in this culture, is very much a fortune or a luxury. And so it says here, spare, uh, spend your spare time with them. The next one is give them hugs. Again, if you are Filipino, in the Filipino culture, we really rarely give hugs. But you know, once you live in the United States, you kind of get in the hang of uh, getting hugs. If you stand around Brian often enough, he will hug you more than five times a day. And so that's just Brian. He would say goodbye four times and give you a hug four times as well. The next one is play with them. So Brian already has a good uh, practice before he gets his kids. Play with them, and that is the kids again. Do the mom stuff. And what does that mean? So whatever the moms need help in, do that. There's no such thing as only the mothers do that, but I'm sure in your, in your marriages, there's your, only the dads do this, only the moms do that. But if, if there's something that the mom is doing, um, dads, why don't you go ahead and do that? The next one is read to them. Do you guys do that? Dads? Read to them? You don't even read to yourself. Read to them, all right? The next one is stand by mom, and not physically just standing by mom. That's not what it means, but stand by mom on her decisions and, and whatever, and they always say that you know, whenever you make decisions for your family, make sure that when you tell it to your kids, you're all united about that. The next one is teach them what? Self-esteem. <coughs> now it's kind of hard to teach self-esteem if we don't have any self-esteem. And so probably the first thing is that we, we receive that self-esteem and then teach them that self-esteem. Teach them finances. I don't know if our dads are the best ones. I don't know if the moms are the best ones. But really, the best one to teach us finances is the Word of God. And so as dads, you know, um, the prayer is that we will be teaching them finances based on what the Word of God says. The second to the last one, it says, be good to yourself. What does that mean, be good to yourself? Be good to yourself. Not just, you know, you keep buying things for yourself. That's not being good to yourself. But be good to yourself. You know, be good to your health. Be, be, uh, be, uh, be, you may not be perfect, like you know, you're not, you're just like everyone else, well, no one is perfect, but whatever good you can do to yourself, you should. And finally, be good to mom. Be nice to mom. Thank you, Atiyo. <laughs> be nice to mom. And they're not talking about your mother, that they're talking about the mother of your children. Be good to mom. So if you're a dad, be nice to mom. If you're a dad, you would want to follow this list, right? Or if you're a mom, you'd like your husband to be following this list. And you might change it up a little bit, dads, and you might look at it and go, that's way, way too many. How many is that? I thought I counted 13 this morning. 13 tips? You know, there's some lists that are shorter than that. But 13 tips to tell us that um, uh, we're going to be, this is the best dad that we can be to follow these tips. And you might change it up a little bit. Some of you might get very overwhelmed because it's a long list. Some of you might even think that it's missing a few things. 
Well, what would be considered the best dad? And that is the, that is the message that I wanted to speak for at the, uh, at the outreach and the same message that we'd like everyone to receive today. And we're not just talking about dads right now. We're not, I'm not just speaking to the dads, but I'm speaking to every single child of God that is gathered here. What would be considered to be the best dad? If teaching your children finances need to be based not on how frugal you are or how the world sees it, or how the, the, the millionaires teach us how to save money and, and how Oprah tells us. If teaching finances to your kids need to be based on the word of God, then that is also where we're going to get. How would you consider yourself to be the best dad? The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke describe a miracle in which Jesus restores to life the, the daughter of Jairus. And again, you, you people at the... Um, the, uh, the outreach probably heard a little bit of this, but the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke describe this miracle in which Jesus restores to life. And when we say restored to life, we're not really talking about, oh, you know, she was very sick and then she was healed. But it's actually more than that. Jairus' daughter was dead. And, and as, as some of you or most of you know the story, if not all of you know the story, Jairus' daughter was restored to life. So let's talk a little bit about Jairus. Who is Jairus? Who's this guy? Jairus was a synagogue leader, okay? A synagogue leader who pleaded with Jesus to come to his house because his daughter was dying. So at that point, when Jairus went to Jesus and pleaded with him, you know, his, uh, his knowledge was his daughter was dying. And while Jesus, and so Jesus said, okay, I'll go ahead and walk to, to your house. Um, so G well, Jesus was walking to Jairus' house. Imagine this, when Jesus is walking, of course, he's got the 12 guys with him. But not only just 12, but there's also many, many other followers that are kind of going with, <clears throat> with him. So think about it as, uh, as like uh, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt when they were still together, and all their kids, and all the nannies, and all the security, and all the PR, and all the stylists, and everyone else that, that comes with them. Uh, you know, they kind of go and fill up a whole plane. They kind of go with them. I've never seen them, but I've seen pictures where they come out of, the, uh, of LAX and you think that that's the whole, the whole it's, the, it's the passengers and crew of one plane. And so, you know, you've got, you've got Jesus walking. And so many, many people, while Jesus is walking, are just not walking with him. They're all talking to him. They're probably asking him something. And Jairus is, is standing there. I mean, not just standing, but walking with him and going, you know, let's get a little bit, you know, get a move on this. Hopefully, we'll get a little bit faster because, once again, what is happening at his house? His mother, his uh, daughter, is dying. And so while Jesus is walking to Jairus' house, a woman, and here we go, a woman suffering from internal bleeding touched Jesus, touched Jesus and was healed. And so before G this happened before Jesus arrived at Jairus' house. No, Jesus did not stop when, when this, when this uh, woman was healed. But Jairus was told that, uh, that, but during that time, I want to read a little bit of the story so that I don't kind of you know, give it away for some people who have not read it. So let's go to chapter 8, verse 41 to 42 of Luke. I'm sorry. Luke chapter 8, verses 41 to 42. We're going to read more than that, but we're going to start off with this couple of, of, of verses. And so this is, this is the story. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. That a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. On his way, and as I said a while ago, on his way, before he can get to Jairus' house, and you, must, you might remember that, uh, you, might, you might see me repeat a few things. Remember now, originally this message is for the senior citizens over at Pomona. And so I'm thinking that sometimes they kind of forget it, so I have to repeat it. So I'm, I'm going to um, apologize to you ahead of time and say that, yeah, we, we got it, Pastor Jay. You, you already said it. But that's, that's why I had this written this way. Well, on his way, before he can get to Jairus' house, as I said a while ago, Jesus performs a miracle. And the, the illustration that I gave at, the, at Pomona for, for, this, for this little point that I, I have to uh, talk about is that on your way to somewhere, sometimes we get very, well, no, not sometimes, but all the time we get very impatient. 
We would like to get there very quickly. When uh, we go home to the Philippines, how long does it take to get on the plane and go home? If it's a straight flight? 16 hours. 16 hours. And I don't know, I haven't gone home of, uh, the past recently, but you know, the, the, the last flight that I took, the second to the last flight that I took, I remember, was Philippine Airlines, and we had to stop in Guam for three hours. And that was the longest three hours, although I have to say that I was in first class, and so I was very happy about that. You know, I didn't know what was going on in the, the cattle ranch down there in the economy. But, you know, I felt really good in, in, um, in, um, in first class. But I remember going, that's the only time I've been on first class. Every time I go somewhere that's, that's far, it, it takes forever. It takes six, uh, 15, 14 hours to get to Dubai straight. And I, you, 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 as you all know, I've done that many, many times. Uh, not more than Jeff, but I've done it many times. And there are times when I'm just like, how long does it take? And that, now how long does it take to, for the plane to take off? Because that will add a few more hours to, to, to me traveling. So on his way, before he can get to Jairus' house, Jesus had to perform a miracle. And it's like going on a long road trip. And I don't know about you, but have you been on a road trip? And I'm not talking about airplane, because that's even probably more, um, it's probably better, because it's faster. But have, have, ever, have you ever taken your family in a car and driven far? And when I say far, I'm not just talking here to San Francisco. But we do that all the time. Here to Vegas. That's yes, here to San Diego. But we're talking about cross country. Yes. Yes. Going from coast to coast. Done that through two, three times. And, and, and every time I start the journey, I'm so excited. By the time I get to... You know, 12 hours in the car, I go, why am I doing this? Why did I not take a train? Or why did I not take a plane? But you know, you've, you've been on this long road trip, and there's going to be stops. There's going to be delays before you get there. Especially when you are a child. Especially when you're not the one driving. Especially if you're not the one sitting beside the driver and you cannot see everything. Everyone wants to be in the driver's seat, or everyone wants to be in the, what is that called? shotgun uh, seat, but no one wants to be in the back. But sometimes we're, we're stuck in the back, especially us children when we remember us taking or traveling. And if you're stuck in the back and you can't see and you cannot tell where you're going, the only thing we ask, and when I ask this question over at, um, at, um, at Pomona, the only, pers- the only child who answered me was Ronan. And he said, what, what do you, when you can't see and you can't tell where you're going, the only thing we ask all the time is what? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And it's so annoying to the parents, right? Because it's like these kids are asking every two minutes. It's like, if I, if I said we're not there yet two minutes ago, we are not going to be there after two minutes. But the kids have a reason. Because they know that there's, not, there's going to be some breaks they know that there's going to be some delay. They, don't, they know that, uh, that they don't know, I'm sorry, what mom and dad know and what mom and dad are planning. We don't know what, we're, what, what they're going to be doing. And you might say, nowadays, which is probably better than before, nowadays the kids have their GPS, their Google Maps, and on, our, on their tablets and on their phones, and some of them know exactly where we're going, where you're going, and so you know, they just kind of follow the blue dot and goes, you know, oh, I, I know where we're going. But there should be, so the question is there should be, or, or the statement is, there should be less questions then. No, because we still don't know what the driver is thinking. We still don't know what our parents want to go, what to, go, what to do. And, and, and I gave this illustration, like mom has to go to the bathroom. I don't know if you have a mom or a dad that goes to the bathroom every time. And that's a bit annoying, isn't it? Because it's like, bathroom again? If you were with us in Israel two years ago, you know, our, our um, what's his name? Our tour guide, Hinnick, cannot believe how many times we had to go to the bathroom. Well, too many, how many times we had to go to the bathroom and how many times we had to stop and shop. Those are the two things that he's like, there, we're always delayed because we all need to go to the bathroom. We all need to go shopping. Or, you know, dad wants to, go, to buy some honey and strawberry jam on the roadside store. And mom saw an outlet, decides to stop and shop. And you know how that goes when the mom starts shopping. We will never get to where we are going. My point, after this long illustration, is to tell everyone this. 
Can you imagine what Jairus was thinking? Here, here's Jairus with, with her, his daughter dying, and Jesus said, yes, I'm going to go to your house. And he's like, can you walk a little bit faster? Can you tell all these people to go home so that we can get this faster? Oh, oh my gosh, and you're going to perform a healing miracle right now? There's a healing miracle. I was there first. I asked you first. There's a miracle that you have to perform over there. So why are we stopping? Why are we healing? Jesus, did I tell you my daughter is dying? How many times have I done that? In a way, time is of the essence here. So this is what happens. As Jesus was on his way, um, continue in verse 43. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him, touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. And of course, Jesus said, who touched me? When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus, and so basically the, the disciples are saying, really now you're asking us who touched you? But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling at fe- and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and, no- and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. We go back to Jairus going, do we have to talk about this? Do we have to really talk about this? Can't we go now? So we go back to Jairus. Nothing is said in these verses on how he looked. Nothing is said if he had something, if he said something else under his breath. We are all sure he is panicked. He's hurrying up Jesus, maybe annoyed that Jesus had to make a stop. I remember a friend in college, we all lived in, in one wing of the dorm. All of us were friends and we said, you know, when we sign up for dorms, we're going to all go to occupy one, one uh, wing. And I, I know that Jeff is listening, so she remembers this friend of ours. And she, every time we have to go to dinner, because we have to be there. You know, when the dinner starts at 5, we want to be there for 50 because there's a lot of people who are going to dinner. And so we want to be there all, and we all want to go together. So if we're all in our rooms taking our sweet little time, she would be in the middle of the hall and she would go belly, belly, chop, chop. As a Filipino coming to the United States, I have no idea what that meant. Uh, I still don't know what belly, belly is. I know chop, chop means what? Hurry up. Do you know what, where that came from? From actually from a Chinese, it's a chop chop means um, hurry or, or something like that, not chop chop. Okay, so you know she would whenever we hear her say belly belly chop chop, she's saying we gotta go now, or else I'm gonna leave. She said I'm gonna leave and I'm going to just go to dinner by myself because I'm sorry. Maybe Jairus said that. So now we read about what happened after the pit stop. So he did the pit stop, right? So uh, continue on chapter eight again, verses forty nine. To 56. And this is the last of the story. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Basically, too late. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. And Jesus said, stop wailing. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. In conclusion, you can have the best tips. You can even say you're the perfect dad. As a daughter, you might say, or as a son, you might say, my dad is the perfect dad. Because my dad did this, my dad did that. As a dad, you might say, I am a good dad. In fact, if my kids tell me I'm the best dad, I'm going to take that. Because I raised my kids well. And, I, and, I, you can say, uh, and, and you can say that you have followed everything on that list, plus more. But really, if we go into the heart of the matter, if we go back to the word of God and not define ourselves for what the internet says a best dad is, or what psychology today says the best dad is, or what Cosmopolitan says the best dad is, or what Esquire magazine tells you the best dad is, 
You can raise your good year, you can raise your kids well, and you can say that you followed every single thing on that list, but the best dad is the one who is just like Jairus. So the question to you dads this morning is this. Dad, are you a father like Jairus? And maybe this, this question is not only for dads, but for moms as well. But right now, we are focusing on our dads. Dad, are you a father like Jairus? Does it show in your life that you have all your concern for your children there? Are you a dad like Jairus in your confidence in Christ to meet your child's needs? Are you a dad like Jairus in your commitment to overcome any obstacle that stands in your way to get the best for your children? This is exactly what the best tip is if Jairus is going to give us a list. In your concern for your children, does it show? Lord Jesus, my daughter is dying. Please come to my house. Are you a dad like Jairus in your confidence in Christ? Instead of going somewhere else, I'm going to go to Jesus Christ. I may not know him. I, I, I just heard about him, but I have faith right now that he's the only one who can heal my daughter or my child. Are you a dad like Jairus in your commitment? And it doesn't matter if there's many pit stops on the way. It doesn't matter if it takes forever. We feel the healing will come. But in our commitment to over, do we have the commitment to overcome any obstacle that stands in your way to get the best for your children? If you dads and fathers will do what Jairus did to get Jesus' help for your sons and for your daughters, Jesus Christ would honor your faith. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ would honor your faith if you dads and fathers will do what Jairus did. Because he did it to Jairus and he will do it to you. Jesus Christ would honor your faith. You would, they would, he would honor your commitment and he would honor your confidence in you. The best dad you can be, and I don't care what the mug says and I don't really care what the shirt says because you can always put that there. The best dad you can be, and by the way, it's never too late. And I had to put that in when I was speaking over, because sometimes when we get to an age where we're getting older, and I, I can probably say this because I'm getting older, but I don't have any kids. I'm not a parent. But sometimes when we get older, we start thinking that it's too late. I, you know, I've already raised all my kids. Some of them turned out bad. Some of them turned out good. And so, you know, I, I've done that. So I, I don't know if I, can, if I still have time to do this. But the best dad you can be, and by the way, it's never too late, is be the dad that believes in Jesus and puts his trust in him. Be the dad who says, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and I love my kids with the love of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Please stand and we're going to pray.